Now, several times I've had issues with periodic table videos. I mean, for me, they've just been these mm, teeth grinding moments when they make statements like this. But the flame separates into two parts from the point where you add the match. This is actually quite a well-known effect when there are gas explosions in people's houses, when they light a match when there's gas in their house. Very often the person who lights the match is okay because the explosion spreads away from them and it does huge damage and they're left in the middle feeling a bit stupid because the house has gone. Hmm, not so sure about that. You see, the thing about fuel air burns is they will happily run to a couple of thousand degrees Celsius. That's getting on for half the temperature at the surface of the sun. That is, if you were to wade into such a mixture and set it off, you would probably be looking at 100% burns. Secondly, fuel air detonations are associated with fearsome pressure waves. For instance, the hydrogen-oxygen detonation produces about a 7 atmosphere pressure wave. And just to put that into perspective... Blast injuries to exposed personnel, represented by this dummy, is usually severe over 3 psi. Here it was 6 psi. With the hydrogen-oxygen detonation, you're looking at about 10 times this. So for me, the most likely explanation of this observation is that if you have 100% air here and 100% gas over here, there will only be a very small range where you'll actually get a detonation. That's basically where the reaction's proceeding faster than the shockwave can propagate in the medium. That's it's traveling faster than the speed of sound. And just so we're clear, this is what a propane burn looks like and this is what a detonation looks like. However, there's a much wider range of compositions where burns can take place. Now, this is the thing. If you were to randomly set off a gas-air mixture, it's far more likely to burn than explode, or it's more likely to burn to a place where a detonation can occur. And I think that's a far more likely explanation of why people who set off gas explosions are more likely to survive, is because they don't set them off where they detonate. I mean, going way back, this is another one that bugged me. The reaction with water, which removes an electron from the cesium atom, is much easier because it needs less energy. So if there's less energy needed to remove the electron from the cesium, then there's more energy left to release as heat. Because the thermodynamics of these systems are known, and it's not a satisfactory explanation for the observations here. Indeed, I even wrote Polyakov telling him that the thermodynamic argument was not the right explanation, and even gave him the calculations. Now, I don't know if he ever got that, but I never received a reply, and no annotation ever appeared on the video, and I didn't pursue the matter. I mean, for me, even back then, the real interesting question was, how do you get a heterogeneous reaction to proceed at detonation-type speeds? I mean, even on this high-speed video, where the frames are about 4 milliseconds apart, it's there one frame, and it's gone the next. Let's compare this to another heterogeneous reaction. That's a balloon full of hydrogen burning. Now, this is considered a fast reaction, and even at that, you can see that it, there's many frames on the video, because this reaction is fundamentally limited to the speed at which the oxygen and the hydrogen can mix. Yet, with the alkali metals reacting with water, in one frame it's there as a blob of molten metal, and the next, boom, gone. Now, that just shouldn't happen. And that, going way back, prompted me to take a look at these things at high speed and to make the unexpected discovery that when you actually react potassium with water, you can actually see the green potassium gas being evolved. Incidentally, this is also a subtle error. And you can see an orange colour, which is probably the colour of hot sodium vapour. Sodium gas, it turns out, is blue. It's only the excitations that you get by knocking the electrons around the sodium atom that you get the yellow emission colour. So anyway, I did a load of experiments on these things and messed up two high-speed cameras in the process and still did not have a satisfactory explanation. Now, recently, periodic table videos have got themselves a high-speed camera and have also taken a look at this reaction. And I found these videos fascinating, partly because their camera is a lot better than mine. Looks like it's running at about a thousand frames per second. And even at that, well, one frame it's there, the next frame it's gone. Now, the explanations the periodic table video boys come up with, I find deeply problematic. Celsius or centigrade, however you like to say it, and which is very close to the boiling point of water. And of course, it could have been hotter than 96 degrees. So when the water goes in, it may well be 
in an environment that is higher than its boiling point. Come on, since when could heat transfer to water at detonation type speeds? Look, even when you put water on a hot stove, when does it ever detonate? Holy crap. <laughs> so I started scratching my head again and eventually came up with what I actually feel is now, for the first time, a satisfactory explanation as to what's going on here. You see, the fundamental problem, as I stated almost two years ago, is that the sodium is here and the water is here and they can only react on the interface. And when they do react, they generate both hydrogen and steam from the heat and those two will tend to keep the reagents apart and slow down the rate of the reaction. Now, all explosions follow a sort of exponential mathematics, that is, that is when a reaction occurs, it has a certain probability of stimulating another reaction. And in order for an explosion to ensue, you need one reaction to stimulate at least one more reaction. And so this is the thing, when you've got the sodium and the water, the reaction that takes place actually inhibits further reaction by creating gas on the interface that separates the two reagents. That is, it inhibits the reaction. It's the opposite of what you need for an explosion or a detonation. However, it's when you start drawing it like this that you realize that when you get this reaction on the surface, you've actually sown the seeds for a Coulombic explosion. Look, when you start, you have the sodium ions here stabilized by the conduction band of electrons. And when you get a good strong contact between these two, the electrons shuffle over and give you hydrogen atoms and hydroxides. So now all of a sudden, you've got all of these sodium ions next to each other without the stabilizing electrons. And on the other side, you've got all of these hydroxides, all these negatively charged ions next to each other. Now the sodium and the hydroxide ions being together, that's not a problem. But having all of those sodium ions next to each other, that's a big problem. They're going to move apart. And when they do that, they sort of create almost this, they create a new surface. And not only that, they convert, create this sort of conveyor belt type structure that allows both of these reagents to come together. You have this positive feedback mechanism that allows this heterogeneous reaction, this exponential mixing. And therefore, you have the potential for an explosion. Now, at an interesting hypothesis, and yeah, testability is the big thing in science. And sure, this is a, a testable hypothesis of sorts. Well, in order for the sodium to react fully with water, it only requires about an equivolume of water. So the whole reaction is going to take place in a volume about the size of the sodium droplet. And then once you get this good contact, this expanding interface is created, it's just going to pan out and consume the whole of the blob of sodium and about a similar volume of water, and it'll pan out, I think, in a plane. And so you would expect something like this. Indeed, you could even argue that you see this in one frame on the Nottingham video, where you have this rather strange, apparently planar, a uh, shockwave that comes out. Then, of course, once all this reaction has taken place, you have the hydrogen that's generated starts to expand, and that's what blows everything apart. But I would predict that you will actually see the whole of the sodium and the water being consumed um, in a very, very small volume. However, in order to see this, you would need better data. Look, I'm looking at 300 frames per second here, and one frame is there, and the next it's gone. But from this, I can estimate that you would need something in the order of 10,000 frames per second to have a good chance of seeing what's going on here. So if the Nottingham boys drop the resolution on their camera, jack up the frame rate, pour on the light, I think that the camera that they've got is actually capable of determining whether this is the correct mechanism or not. Now, I should add that if this is the right explanation, then this would basically be an entirely new category of explanations of explosions. That is, to my knowledge, no one has ever attempted to explain explosions in this fashion before, in this Coulombic explosion type fashion. And if this is the discovery of a new mechanism, there may well be some very interesting properties associated with it. And this is really important. It goes to show how something as simple as the reaction of sodium with water, something that has been taught in almost every secondary school on this planet by tens of thousands of teachers for the best part of the last hundred years, and yet they've all missed with 
hindsight, what is the bloody obvious? That is, how can you get an explosion out of a macroscopically heterogeneous system?